welcome back for something new. Now, this video is going to be a partial address to the issue of fantasy arms and armor, and as we perceive them today, and the question of practicality. This presentation is based on a long-term pet peeve I have. It started in May 2013, and it started with a series of articles why we should retire boob armor or why boob armor will kill you. Now, those articles were written by people who never made a suit of armor in their life. And after having a conversation with one of the classmates I had on the topic, the conversation went the following way. Uh, boob armor is entirely unnecessary and it accents uh, parts of the female anatomy that are not necessary to combat, to which I responded with a series of Greek armor images. I will address those later. Well, well, that may be true that the breasts of Greek warriors were accented, but it would be the same as accenting a man's beard, which is entirely unnecessary for combat. To which I responded with several images of Greek, and not only Greek, armors. In the course of this conversation, I realized that what's at stake is not the modern perception of what fantasy is, but rather an ignorance of the history of aesthetics in arms and armor, starting with ancient Greece and going all the way through the Renaissance. Now, with that in mind, let's brush up on much-needed history. In the course of this specific presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the aesthetic history of what is known as the West, with only slight comparisons with the Middle East. The subject of Eastern arms and armor will be addressed in much later presentations. Now, our sense of aesthetics in the West is highly, highly owed to the history of art in ancient Greece, as well as their philosophy. If we compare the aesthetics of the West, which is heavily sculptural and focuses on the three-dimensional sense of the body with its fleshy embodiment in coming alive, to, let's say, uh, the Islamic world, what becomes clear is that the West focuses on sculpture and the Islamic world is more of a calligraphic textile art aesthetic. You can see it in the Taj Mahal compared to the Cathedral of Sharp. Now, let's look at our first image. This is the Kouros, made approximately uh, 530 before the Common Era, BCE. Uh, it portrays a young male who would have been either water bearer or a spear bearer, uh, a little bit rigid, uh, a little bit archaic, and it's classified as the archaic period of Greek art. Uh, it is very stiff because the Greek realism doesn't come into being just yet. However, that is the progenitor of our next image. The next image is Doryphorus Polycleitus, made almost a hundred years exactly after the first image, Kouros. Uh, Doryphorus uh, was made in 440 BCE. Uh, because it's BCE, the numbers decrease up until uh, the mythical year zero. What you see in the Doryphorus, and the Doryphorus is clearly a young male warrior. Uh, he is very well toned. He would have had a spear in his hand. The spear was lost. And most of the images we see now are Roman copies of the Greek bronze original. However, we see a clear development. And what we see in aesthetic development here is the treatment of the body is, as something worthy of preservation, something worthy of studying and lauding. Uh, we see the development of the contraposta. The contraposta is an artistic technique where the body is turned just slightly to make it come alive visually, make it more interesting, and at the same time allowing the viewer to appreciate it from all three dimensions compared to the archaic period where the clear intended perspective is from the front. Why this is interesting is that around the same time Greek hoplite armor uh, 
started imitating the bare muscular chest. Uh, what those things together give us is that the image of the warrior, the warrior's muscles, were considered sexy at the time for ancient Greeks. Uh, what adds to that perception, the comparison of military arts and the image of the self as constructed through the narrative of a sexual persona are the Olympic Games. Um, very few people remember that there used to be an event in the Olympic Games and some might want to bring it back, is the naked running, usually on the beach, with arms and armor. So it would be a whole bunch of young guys, all oiled up, running around with spears or swords and shields, racing each other. Uh, well, well, to us modern people, this obviously appears, well, mm -hmm, that's clearly sexy. However, even during the time, it was considered quite risque. Uh, that specific event was prohibited from being attended by women. Uh, we know that because the penalty for that would have been death or public shaming. However, women did in fact attend that event. And, uh, what comes to mind is the scene from uh, Monty Python Life of Brian where women would buy beards to dress up as men for public stoning. In fact, very similar things probably would have happened as we know from the graffiti art in Athens where women would discuss the relative appeal of their favorite competitors. Let's look at the caress a little bit closer. The artist, and by this point the armor is a full-blown artist, has went so far as to not only depict the glistening muscles, but also the nipples of the bare chest. The idea is that the warrior, the soldier clad in this armor, is so brave, so tough, that they can go out into war naked. Uh, the green patina, you see, would not have been present at the time of its use, but rather the suit would have been polished to look like gold. Polished bronze looks exactly like gold. And now imagine an entire phalanx of people clad in this armor descending upon their enemy with the sun reflecting off of their golden chests. This is a sight of gods from Olympus descending upon the poor mortals. And the gods, being immortal, don't need to wear armor because their bodies are invulnerable. Now let's look at the Phrygian helmet. You see the unnecessary beard that is appearing in bronze. Again, the armor is a full-blown artist depicting it as realistically as possible. This beard probably is again an allusion to the beard of Zeus or a beard of another Olympic god. It is also the case that a full healthy beard is a sign of virility or sexual prowess. And the breastplate combined with a helmet would have been indicators that the person has the body of a god and can show it in more ways than one. So the concept of a warrior necessarily being represented as something more than a killing machine, but rather as an ideal of romance and erotic fantasies was already present in ancient Greece. And that's no wonder. Uh, the concept of the self, the concept of a good life, of an ethical self, was that of balance. It's not the case that you had to, to be a real man or a real warrior force all of your efforts into studying the military arts. No, that would have been too much and that would have been wrong. The idea would have been balance. The Greeks were very much concerned with proper golden mean in every aspect of life. If you practice military arts too much, you're in the wrong. You're not living a good life. The good life is always a balance between the polis and the oikos, that is, between the public and the private. It would be also a balance between relative abstinence as a practice of self-control and engagement in the sweeter pleasures of life. However, the Greek civilization or what it created didn't live long and after the so-called collapse of the Roman Empire, 
very few senses of, of Greek thought remained. Uh, entire Europe was taken over by Christianity in a couple hundred years. What the Christian ideal brought, it erased the sense of the embodied self for a long time. Instead, what comes about as the ideal of a soldier, of a, of a knight, was a martyr, someone who forsakes their flesh for the sake of faith. Um, for example, if you look at medieval icons, especially the lives of martyrs, you don't see any human emotional expressions on their faces. In fact, they're quite serene. A uh, good parallel to that art is Buddhist art. That is, someone goes through suffering, but through the miracle of faith, they don't have any emotions. After all, if they were to show any emotions, that would be a weakness. Now, that is also reflected in the arms and armor of the medieval period before the Renaissance. Uh, what happens is the arms and armor look relatively uh, close to the fashion of the day, which was fairly straight, like a cut tunic, and were relatively similar again to the cloths worn by monks. After all, the highest, uh, well, the most famous event happening before the Renaissance during the High Middle Ages were the Crusades, where entire populations of European military men were mobilized to reconquer Jerusalem. Now, at around the same time, a relatively subversive movement comes about in the lower classes of society. Uh, those people were known as the troubadours. The troubadours uh, were traveling musicians who would sing songs of earthly love, the romantic uh, songs of knights and their escapades. Now, in the upper classes, the knight was essentially Archangel Michael's emissary on earth. The knight would have been clad in shiny armor with bright colors. He was the angel step into the world of mud to protect God's law. And that was the justification for the knight being almost exclusively allowed to carry a sword at all times, unlike a peasant conscript whose weapons would have been taken away. One very important piece of evidence to the religious purpose of the image of the knight in the Middle Ages is actually the form of the European sword. Many modern practitioners of historical European martial art attribute the cruciform guard to its practicality. However, the pagans, also known as Vikings, before the Christian era used quite successfully swords without a cruciform guard. And in fact, the cruciform guard like that on a sword is the exception across the world rather than the rule, meaning that from a practical standpoint, it is not as important as many other things. So what explains the cruciform guard on a sword that has been in use for a long, long time from the advent of the Christian era in Europe? That is prayer. The cruciform guard looks like a cross if you stick the blade into the ground and pray before battle. The religious function of the sword is as important as its martial function, if not more so. The reason for that is everyone you know believes in the holy texts and everyone who even questions them dies. So the religious aspect is more practical than the military one. The ideal of the medieval era before the advent of the Renaissance was concerned with the perfection of the soul rather than the perfection of the body with the salvation of the soul rather than the body's health. And now let's get back to the troubadours. The troubadours existed uh, in the heights between the 11th and the 13th century. What does the 13th century, rather the end of it, bring to Europe? Well, that is the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. You see, crusaders who went to the Middle East brought back texts that were preserved by Arabs, and those texts were ancient Greek thought. 
So the scholars of European institutions started translating them and rediscovering Aristotle and Plato. The thoughts of Aristotle and Plato were very often congruent with Christian thought, and that is no surprise because the creators of the Christian Codex were people who were scholars in those thoughts to begin with in the early days of Christianity. As a result, the church spent a lot of effort translating them, prohibiting a lot of them for the common use or common reading, but some of that idea of balance and the idea that the human being is the zenith of God's creation and as a result their embodied self is to be valued or is rather worthy of artistic achievement comes back. As a result in the 15th century you have the gothic suit of armor. You see looking at this piece and looking at it properly what you will notice is that first and foremost it requires a tremendous knowledge of the human anatomy and how especially the joints the elbows and the knees operate in space the greave or something that protects your shin is not straight down but captures this curve almost like a piece of greek sculpture the narrow waist does not only serve a practical purpose of allowing the armor to sit on the waist rather than the shoulders but at the same time accents that the person is fit they're slender they're upright what happens is this image of a knight is sexy they're glistening not only they are still the archangels and emissary on earth saint michael or saint george walking down between us but at the same time, they are also the subject of someone else's erotic fantasies. Uh, proof of that is the little piece that is almost entirely unnecessary if you're on a horse, especially in the sizes that you see it, and that is the cod piece. One interesting part about the gothic suit of armor, and that is not entirely obvious uh, to the viewer unless they're pointed to it, is that the classical flutes, especially obvious in the back, are imitations of the fashion, the secular fashion worn by people at the time. You see, imitating secular fashion would have been a fair no-no several centuries earlier, but now it is captured in almost complete sculptural per perfection in armor. What is especially noticeable in the back is that those classic flutes imitate the pleats of the jupon that would have been worn by regular people under the armor as well as everyday fashion. The Gothic suit of armor is superseded by the Maximilian suit, said to have been invented by Emperor or self-declared Emperor Maximilian himself. Let's take a closer look at the Maximilian armor breastplate. It is of a globular form, uh, that is, it's like a globe, fairly spherical, and together with the tassets, the pieces of the armor that protect the hips, it forms the hourglass figure. You see, for the longest period of time in European aesthetics, uh, the hourglass figure was associated uh, with the perfect male ideal of beauty rather than the female. It is about as close to boob armor as you can get without accenting the memories themselves. Now, here the fashion influence of armor is absolutely undeniable. The funny thing is about this specific suit or this class of suits is the story of friendship or arguable friendship between King Henry VIII and Emperor Maximilian. It is very important to delve into it. King Henry growing up was prohibited from participating in tournaments. That was very frustrating to the young boy who was very martially minded. Uh, but his father didn't allow him even to ride a horse or practice with a sword. So when the old bastard died, King Henry finally got his wish. He got to play in tournaments. That was a problem. The problem is that England was way behind the times compared to the continent. And through a series of friendships, as the courts go, 
King Henry got to develop a very strong bond with Emperor Maximilian, whose armors were the top notch in Europe. King Henry also felt bad. He always wanted to wear something fantastic to a tournament. One of his suits is a fully engraved silver plated suit for um, well, infantry combat. Now, by that time, engraving or carving of the material by hand with a chisel becomes an obsolete technique when the continent moves to etching. King Maximilian, or Emperor Maximilian rather, sends King Henry a set of gifts. One of those gifts is the grotesque helmet the way we see it now. Remember, grotesque means ugly. Uh, this helmet would have been already uh, a piece that complements an entire set of garniture. However, there's something funny about this helmet. As Professor Tobias Cabell points out, this helmet is a caricature of Emperor Maximilian that is given as a gift to King Henry VIII. Uh, you see the glasses, meaning Emperor Maximilian is making fun of his poor eyesight, the uh, scruffy beard means he's a little bit careless. He's making fun of his buck teeth, so on and so forth. And the horns are also an allusion to some other medieval uh, joke. Now, what this does, it places King Henry in a situation where, to a very reputable event, a king of an entire nation is forced to wear a suit that is a cosplay, a caricature, of another attendee. This is a very uncomfortable situation and yet this suit is the state of the art at the time. The artistic merit of a suit of armor even then as well as now when we're talking about fashion at uh, diplomatic events makes a statement to everybody present in the room. It's a statement of power. And if you demonstrate your power quite well, you can avoid a war or win it without anyone dying. Uh, if you read the book about how Brunelleschi designed his dome, he was interrupted many times by war. But the war that was fought in the medieval times was more often than not, instead of pure bloodshed, a chess game between royals. I move my battalion here, you move it here, I move it here, oh, I don't have any moves left, you win. And very few people die. That was actually more common than we think, that bloodshed was uh, not the preferred tactic. So if you can demonstrate at a diplomatic event that you are more powerful, more erudite, more, much wealthier, than your opponent, you won the war or avoided it. That's the practical reality. This situation gets to be very bad. You see, some princes or local dukes would have more riches than quite a few kings. So they would show up in armor that is much better than that of royalty. And the situation is so bad that the rules for medieval tournaments gets established where only people of royal blood are allowed to have gold on their armor. Uh, only people of royal blood are allowed to have certain colors on their armor because the wealthier nobles were winning the war against kings and that would cause actual unrest in the king's home country. It is very embarrassing to be a poor king. The image of a black knight, for example, comes around from the concept that a noble or even a king was so poor they could not afford a polished or gold engraved suit of armor. So they would have to paint their armor with tar to prevent it from rusting. The armor was expensive and uh, there are stories of a noble being captured by the enemy the family of the noble buying the noble back and then the noble coming back and selling his castle and more in order to get the armor back. Whether those stories are true or not, they do date back to the time of medieval warfare. 
Now, what is also important is that we are looking at these armors with our modern eyes. So we don't really find them as erotically appealing as they would have been in the days where they were made. You see, at the same time that the Renaissance started, what also was happening is a whole bunch of uh, somewhat smutty, by the standard of the days, fiction started being published. One of them is the story of Romanzo. Uh, the story portrays a fictional character going on a fic fictional crusade where the uh, Sultan is dressed in dragon armor, uh, breathes fire, is eight feet tall, so on and so forth. It, it's a scene that is very similar to modern day video games. And it was a story of love, of sexual escapades, and the nobles were imitating the armor of the bad guy from the novel. Uh, here before us we have a piece by Filippo Negroli. Uh, that is 16th century, and it is a dragon helmet. Now, uh, the Sultan was the Sultan of the Muslim army. However, they were portrayed as wearing this sort of armor. However, in reality, uh, the Islamic arms and armor follow the rule of practicality much closer than the European analogs. You see, in the Muslim arm and armor, all you need to protect yourself is some chainmail and some plate. You don't need much more than that. If you put some gold on it, that's great, but from the standpoint of practicality, this is much better than, especially, uh, compared to the hours spent making it, than a full suit of European armor. And yet, European armor chooses to follow the Greek sculptural tradition of glorifying the body as something that moves in space as well as in someone's bed. Let's take a closer look at another Negroli piece. You see the allusion to the classical Greek helmets, where the beard is already gold gilt and portrayed fairly realistically. This would have been the helmet, the pride possession of the owner, and would have been probably presented or shown in action at a tournament. The artistic merit of this piece is about equivalent to any piece of sculpture in Renaissance Florence. And at the same time, just like the ancient Greeks, it indicates the prowess of the wearer. Unlike sword makers, armors were considered to be uh, a much more intellectual sort of craft. A contemporary to Filippo Negroli is Benvenuto Cellini, who even wrote his own biography. Means he was literate. He also was an eminent silversmith and a sculptor, and is studied by almost every single scholar of art history. Before us, we have a morion made for one of the members of the Medici family, and it is almost contemporary to the piece by Negroli. You see, armors very, very often would have been in correspondence in writing letters to the eminent artists of the day. Artists like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Brunelleschi, Bernini, and so on. The image before you, we have a lost piece of art, the battle scene, originally uh, sketched and painted by Leonardo. Uh, the version you most likely see is copied by another Renaissance artist, and it shows absolute fantasy in the arms and armor depicted. Michelangelo would have known what real arms and armor look like, and yet he chose that. And the reason is the need for aesthetic sensibility was of an incredible practical value. In the height of the Renaissance, the nobles, the people who would be commissioning arms and armor, started to feel like they need to demonstrate their erudition and literacy to other nobles. They would start competing against each other, not only in war, not only in the level of handsomeness, but at the same time in their knowledge. So arms and armor would start 
including allusions to classical art, allusions to Homer, as well as Greek versions or classical biblical stories seen through the eyes of Greek philosophy. Thereby, you see uh, Michelangelo's David, for example, or um, let's say Donatello's David. What happens during that era is that the arms and armor, especially armor, gets constructed through a prism of a very well-rounded construction of the self. The construction of the self that ends up stressing more one's own embodied sense of sexuality, virility, as well as joie de vivre. And consequently, we see armors that are not consistent with what quote-unquote is practically necessary. In order to protect yourself from a sword, all you need is a flat plate here, a flat plate there, and a couple of plates right here, and nothing really much more, and yet that is far away from the truth. The truth is much more complicated. It is true that in the history of the world, for the most part, uh, wars were fought by men rather than women. However, our random fantasy uh, armor image that you can pull off of Google would have been closer to the truth if the generals would have been reversed and wars would have been fought by women. After all, if you can defeat the morale of your opponents by showing them that you are much sexier than them, much more educated, and thus much more practiced, you already won the war and you don't need much else. To conclude today's presentation, let's do a quick recap. The warrior, constructed as an embodied self, resulted in a plethora of arms and armor that conveyed an erotic as well as a martial ideal. Many signifiers of this romantic construction have been lost to modernity arguably forever, and we can only excavate bits and pieces of it in the hints left to us by previous artists. And in a sense, submerging yourself into a mentality that combines both the warrior aspect as well as the humane aspect of that, of that ideal is like landing on a different planet and trying to understand a foreign culture. The Greek ideal of a perfect person, of the one who leads a good life, is that of balance. A person who has all in measure between the oikos and the polis, the family, the private life, as well as the public life. And that is already present in Greek art in full sophistication. The Doriferous, as well as the contemporary arms and armor, signify a person who is presented in public, the sculpture would have been seen by all, as well as the arms and armor would have been worn during public duties, war. However, they signal someone who has a rich private life and who is not afraid to show it. The world of the medieval and renaissance eras in the West was not a world where everybody was made equal, or certainly not everybody being morally equal to each other. Human beings were created with individual purposes given to them from above, and they were inherently unequal. A king by birth is not the same as a peasant and not the same as a citizen. And the values that that society produced were radically different and almost incomprehensible to us living nowadays. However, those values were also inherent in the conception of what counts as practical. In the Maximilian suit of armor, the codpiece or the metal penis has been accented to the point of almost characteristic proportions, and yet it served its purpose quite well of signaling the virility of the warrior and the relative superiority of the relevant body part compared to other combatants. The industrialization of the 19th century separated the concept of practicality from the concept of the beautiful. However, those things were not distinct in the centuries prior. In conclusion, what we currently perceive as 
practical has been heavily influenced by contemporary secularism, the values of the middle class, and our having gone through the industrial era. The kings and queens and nobles of old would have been born into the time when nature was thought of as having a purpose built into it by divinity, where being a king or a queen means you own people and that right is given to you from above and you would spend a lot of time and money accenting that divine mandate to rule and at the same time the purposes that would have been thought to have been built into your body included your sexual prowess your martial prowess as well as your ability to be an erudite member of society our contemporary conception of practicality is closer to that of a well-to-do peasant or rather in a democratic bourgeoisie the owner of some wealth rather than that of an elite erudite individual we see things as practical insofar as we can physically use them and then discard them rather as practical because they have inherent worth or because they say something about us that was not always true and we have forgotten that practicality or how we can practice a thing which is what the origin of the word is points to a much larger universe of values to be practical is to practice a discipline or to be embedded in a discipline that is being actively practiced and that embeds you as a whole being including your body including your values and even including your private life in a set of performative acts and one of those acts was war separation of sexuality and violence has only occurred fairly recently in human history. The article that chastises modern fantasy boob armor from 2013 doesn't point to any specific problem in modern conception of fantasy, really. But to me personally, it shows the modern way of forgetting a rich history of literature, performative, as well as visual arts.